Right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this is a very strange way to present. Uh, normally I'm in front of a room talking to live people and I'm sure you're live and I can assure you I am as well. Um, I have a, a, a bit of a declaration to make um, before uh, I go any further. And that is if I stumble, um, there's quite a good reason for that. And the reason is that uh, two years ago, I woke up one Sunday morning and I'd had a stroke and the stroke completely took my voice. Um, I couldn't speak for two months, not a word. And I've had to relearn how to speak. Now, losing your voice is a bit of a crimper, really, for a public speaker. Um, but I hope I won't stumble very much at all. But if I, if I do, then that's the reason. I will now tell you a little bit about Aliens Amongst Us. Now, Aliens Amongst Us is actually one of my favourite talks because it covers a really wide breadth of different subjects. I will talk about things like ants. I will talk about lovely, gorgeous insects like bumblebees, bees, that sort of thing. And also about frogs. Frogs are just the most amazing creatures. I'm sure you'll, you'll agree. Um, they come to our ponds in the spring and sort of spend a few weeks croaking with amphibian love where they mate and lay frog spawn and then they disappear again into the garden for the rest of the year. So they are just fabulous creatures. Uh, amphibians, we've got uh, about five species, I suppose, of amphibian in Britain, including three species of newt, uh, um, uh, species of, in fact, we've got six, two species of uh, toad, and of course the common frog, which you see here on the screen. And we have lots of incredible things that live in our seas around our coasts. Our coastline is very, very, very varied and variable. And there are lots of things to go hunting for in rock pools. It, rock pooling is one of my favorite <laughs> occupations. And I'm often there with a net and a small fish tank, catching things to actually photograph on the fly, so to speak. And there are oodles of spiders, something like 600 different species of spider in Britain. And they are all just fabulous things. Eight legs, spiders got eight legs. Insects like bees and beetles and flies and that sort of thing have six legs. They're sort of the diagnostic characteristics, characteristics if you like, of those two particular uh, species types. And of course, we've got loads and loads of fungi. There's something like 15,000 different types of fungi and slime mold to be found in Britain, going right from the tiny, right up to the sort of macro fungi that we see growing in our gardens and woodlands. And of course, we have lots of different species of butterfly. To date is about 55 to 56 species, but it's sort of growing really daily almost with global warming. And we have lots of bugs and all that sort of thing. And they all add to the rich tapestry that is this aliens amongst us. We have something like, well, let's think, something like well several thousand different species of fly and including hoverflies uh, true flies if you like and that sort of thing and we have nearly 4000 species of beetle in the uk this is a bloody nosed beetle you'll see this particular one is interesting because you can clearly sees compound eyes. This is these sort of two globes at the top of the, the, the sort of midpoint of the screen there. Compound eyes are 
another characteristic of insects. They're a great way for an insect to see the world in the sort of multivision, if you like. And each one of those little dots that you can see on the screen there is a single lens. And each lens gives the, the insect, whether it be a beetle, a fly, a hoverfly, or whatever, a sort of high, def high definition view of the world. If I pause, by the way, it's because I'm taking a drink, which of course you can't see, but there you go. Insects feed quite avidly on other insects. What we have here is a group of wood ants which are dismembering a beautiful golden ringed dragonfly. Now with my photographs, I always like to have a, have a sort of backstory to them because I think that's important to sort of show you where I'm coming from and that sort of thing. Well, this backstory, it goes something like this. Um, this particular scene was photographed on the road up to um, the funicular railway station in the Cairngorms. Uh, wood ants are very common in the, in the woodlands, in the Cairngorms, and as are golden green dragonflies. This poor dragonfly had been hit by a car and it was dead. And the wood ants found it and they were ba basically taking it apart to go take it back to their nest. Well, I was lying in the, in the road with my head in the road trying to photograph this scene. Um, and the road is incredible. If you know the road, you'll know that it is, it, it's incredibly busy. And each time a car came down that looked like it was going to squash my head, my friend Jonathan grabbed my collar and hauled me vert vertically until the car had gone by and then he lowered me back into place. So, and it was great. It was a, a sort of wonderful uh, thing to experience. Now, this is a, this is a great shot to show the, you, you these compound eyes. Clegs, horseflies, this is a horsefly, have brilliant compound eyes. There's no doubt about it. And often they're extremely colourful. And as I said earlier, each one of those little dots is a single lens and it gives the, the insect a kind of multi view of the world. And each one is a sort of high definition camera. So insects generally have got extremely good vision. Predators, such as dragonflies and that sort of thing, have got excellent vision. And they have to have that, of course, because they are going to hunt, well, hunt down everything else, really. Some creatures only deserve to be small. This is a green tiger beetle. Uh, if this is a, a beetle which is about an inch long, I suppose, something like that. But if you imagine this particular creature the size of a Ford Mondeo, we'd all be dead by now because it's an incredible predator. It eats ants and that sort of thing, and he's a very, very fast runner indeed. In fact, it's so fast it could outrun a man, and it could certainly outrun me because, because of the stroke. I thought I also walk with a limp, so I can't run at all. So if there was a, one out there the size of a, size of a Ford Mondeo, I would be uh, dead right now. Green tiger beetles are a heathland species. Uh, they're sort of around kind of mid-May onwards, something like that. And they have this incredible sort of hopping, whirring uh, flight that they do to get around, as well as running people, uh, people running things down as well. This is one of my favorite weevils. It's a hazel weevil. Um, and I love the color of that. And I also, with all the weaves, weevils, I love the, those sort of antenna in, antennae that they have sticking out of the, the front of their noses. There are dozens, if not hundreds of species of weevil in, uh, in Britain, and they go to form that sort of uh, part of that 4,000 species of beetles. This is a jewel beetle, and I put it in because it's actually a continental species, this particular one. But I put it in because that gold lame coat is just absolutely beautiful. It's about an inch and a half long, so it's actually quite a substantial beetle. 
all beetles, or at least 99.9% .9 of beetles, have underneath their um, wing casings, they have wings and they can, can easily fly from place to place and colonize reasonably easily. This is another weevil. And this is a tiny little creature. It's about the size of a, of a sort of sweet ex sweetness. So it's very small indeed, this one. Um, but I love that lovely, fabulous nose that it's, it's got and the antennae that just stick out at odd angles from this creature. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of these things living in every square meter of grassland that we have in Britain. And so there are, as a group, there are a very, very common um, range of species indeed. This is a, a continental uh, weevil. This one was nearly two inches long, so it's actually quite a whopper. Um, I have no idea what the species is with this one, but uh, it is quite a, uh, a big creature and it was trundling along. And I thought, you know, I've got to take a photograph of that, largely because, again, I love, I love it, its nose and its lovely antennae uh, poking out of the middle. I call this the Popeye beetle. It isn't really called the Popeye beetle. It's a thick thighed flower beetle. That's quite a mouthful. So I think Popeye beetle uh, really does it, it justice. This is a male, only the males of this particular species have those thick thighs. Both the males and the females have these sort of lovely iridescent um, well, wing cases and cases and uh, body and head. And this is a harlequin beetle. Now, harlequin beetles are basically a European species, and you often find them walking nose to tail in sort of a procession from place to place. Um, they're about, I don't know, half an inch long from tip of nose to tip of tail, something like that. And I've seen hundreds of them walking from place to place in this sort of caravan uh, type uh, effect. This is a, another continental species, um, which also occurs on the south coast of Britain, and it is still a beetle. Um, it's a thing called a bee chafer, and doesn't it just look like a bee or a wasp or something like that? And that's exactly what it wants you to believe. It wants you to believe that if you touch it, you will get stung. Beautiful thing, things, you often find them feeding on um, pollen and uh, uh, flower heads and that sort of thing. Um, it's about an inch long, I suppose, something like that. So it's, it's quite a big-ish uh, beetle. Ladybird, ladybird, fly away home. I can never remember the, the rest of that. Something to do with his house being on fire, I think. There are around about 40, 45 species plus, actually of ladybirds found in Britain. Some of them don't actually look like ladybirds at all. This is a sort of classic uh, ladybird. It's a seven spot ladybird. Um, and it has that, that sort of classic red and black uh, wing cases. Ladybirds are fabulous for the gardener. They eat all sorts of things that can uh, do your roses harm and that sort of thing like aphids. And even the, uh, the larvae are aphid eaters extraordinaire. And this is the sort of life cycle, really, of uh, a ladybird. On the left, on the far left, we have the larvae. Now, the larvae doesn't look anything like a ladybird at all, does it? Not, not in the slightest. It's a fabulous hunter of aphids and other harmful insects in the garden. It will, it develops from an egg, hatches, for, hatches from an egg, and goes through what are called instars, whereby it just ends up growing and growing and growing. It gets to a point where it can't really grow anymore after about a month, maybe something like that, and it then pupates. The image in the middle is a pupated ladybird larva. Inside that pupa, it metamorphoses a little bit like um, butterflies 
uh, and dragonflies do as well in to a slightly lesser extent but inside that pupil case it changes from the larva into the wonderful ladybird that we can see there i think ants are absolutely fascinating creatures in britain we've got something like 50 or so different species of ant, ranging from the very, very small, sort of micro ants almost, right up to the large uh, wood ants, which can actually be very big indeed. Now, wood ants in particular are called mound building ants, and that's exactly like what they do. They live by and large in conifer plantations where they construct a nest out of pine needles and that sort of thing and the nest can be home to tens of thousands of individuals and each of those individuals know their place they know exactly their place in the hierarchy in the heart of the nest there will be, will be anything up to half a dozen or so female ants that lay eggs and the eggs will be sort of looked after in galleries and hatched out to form worker ants like you've got here or guard ants or even even more uh, female and uh, queen ants now wood ants are ridiculously strong for their size this is a wood ant pulling uh, the bud if you like from a large tree now that would be the equivalent of us dragging a Ford Focus with our teeth. Now, I don't know about you, I've got all my teeth and I still would, wouldn't be able to do it. Um, so wood ants are incredibly strong and very, very versatile. They're also quite aggressive and they will attack all sorts of creatures and drag them back to the nest to feed the larvae and that sort of thing. If you run your hand over a wood ant nest, maybe about five centimeters or so above it, and then smell your hand, it will smell of formic acid because the ants will be defending their nest by squirting you with this strange smelling liquid uh, in the hope that you, you will go away without disturbing the nest. There are hundreds of species of flies in Britain, thousands of species of flies. These are green bottles. And what you can see here, and I thought was, this was quite a fun picture really, because this is a, this is a bit of um, fox poo and the flies are actually feeding on the fox poo. Now, okay, it's, it's a bit of a, um, a horrible thing to countenance, but it's what they do. Uh, but I like the photograph because it all of the you've got all of these wonderful uh, green bottle um, bottoms sticking up into the air as they feed on the fox poo. Flies can be a nuisance, certainly in the summer when they get into the house, that sort of, sort of thing. And of course, you don't really want them around food. They, they feed by landing on your food and what's the polite way of putting it? They actually vomit onto the onto the food to, if you like, pre-digest it, and then they suck it up using their um, their mouthpieces. They don't have teeth or anything like that, and so they can't, if you like, chomp into anything. So they have to have this uh, digestive way of feeding. As I said earlier on, clegs, and this is another species of cleg or horse flying have the most incredible eyes i don't know if you knew this this but um clegs and horse flies they bite it's it goes without sort of saying really if you go out into the countryside or even your garden you may actually get bitten by a clag or a horse fly or even a mosquito because this uh, next anecdote stands for that as well the interesting thing, oh, I think it's interesting, the thing about clegs is that when you get bitten, you will be bitten by a female clegg. And she will bite you because she wants to get a drink of your blood. 
and she wants a drink of your blood because she uses the proteins in your blood to make her eggs. Now, as I say, it's only the females that bite. The males don't bite, by and large. They're very much benign creatures. They spend their time walking the dog, playing golf, down the pub, that sort of thing, and they don't generally bite. And as I say, the same thing goes for mosquitoes uh, in exactly the same way. This is one of my favorite species of bee and wasp. There are something like 200 species of bee, of which, which 25 species are bumblebees, and there are countless species of wasp and that sort of thing. Some of them are a nuisance, the sort of uh, the common, uh, the common wasp can be a real nuisance at picnics. Hornets are huge, they're sort of, you know, anything up to top lung, but actually they, they generally tend to be quite um, tame. <laughs> I once had somebody, this is quite a, a strange thing, I once had somebody send me um, a hornet through the post in a little pot uh, because I, I happened to mention to him ages since that I wanted to photograph a hornet and he caught one and he sent it through to me in the post. It was still alive and I let it, let it go and it's perfectly fine. So, um, but they are quite benign creatures. Um, they tend to bite actually more than they sting, which is quite good really, because I su suspect the sting is quite, uh, quite tricky. This is a ruby-tailed ruby wasp, and it's one of the smaller species of wasp that we have in Britain. It's about five millimetres long. I have no idea what that is in old money, but it's a very small creature indeed. And it sort of flits around. This one was actually photographed um, sort of walking up the brickwork of my house. And you often find that they sort of hunt small insects there and that sort of thing. But isn't it just a magnificent creature? It is just the most amazing thing to, uh, to see in close up. And it isn't really until you actually close in on these things that you start to appreciate just how beautiful they are. This creature hustles and bustles around. And so you wouldn't really get to see what it looks like. Uh, until you take a picture of it and, and view it as we are viewing it here. In Britain, there are a large number of solitary wasps. I don't know if you can remember or remember seeing um, one of these uh, Disney film True Life Adventures, whereby a solitary wasp was trying to uh, sting a tarantula. Uh, and eventually it managed to do that and it dragged the tarantula underground into a burrow and it laid an egg on the tarantula. The tarantula was still alive um, and the solitary wasp laid an egg on the tarantula and the egg hatched and the larva ate the tarantula from the inside out. And now, you know, nature is red in tooth and claw and sting in this case. And solitary wasps do pretty much the same thing. Now, of course, we don't have tarantulas of that sort in Britain. We do have very similar species, but not to the extent and the size of the tarantulas we had in the Disney uh, adventure. But they will sting insects and dig a burrow and drag the insects down into the burrow, lay an egg on them, and then come out and seal the burrow up. And inside the burrow, the same thing would happen to the insect as happened to the tarantula. Solitary uh, wasps, I think, are fabulous. Most of them these days are pretty rare. Uh, a lot of them are heathland species. And of course, a lot of lowland heaths have been built on and that sort of thing. So they are becoming increasingly rare. Uh, generally, they, they're very slender like this one. And they have that sort of wonderful um, abdomen with the stinger in the end of it. This creature 
formed one of my red letter days. I was in a woodland in uh, Cornwall photographing a plant called Cornish bladder seed, which is a, a very rare species of umbellifer. And on the way back to the car, I happened to pass a stand of felled conifers and smothered, smothered all over the, uh, the conifers were dozens of this creature, a horn tail. Now it's a species of sawfly. It's not a wasp as such as a sawfly. And it has an incredible ovipositor. You know, you can see half of the ovipositor on this uh, female. What she does is she unfurls that to twice that particular length and she inserts it into the timber and lays her eggs inside the timber. Fabulous creatures. She's about an inch, inch and a half from tip of nose to tip of tail. So she's quite an impressive creature. And as I say, it was one of my red letter days. I'd only ever seen one before, and that was one flying away. So I'd never actually seen one like this to be able to photograph it. So I was really quite uh, happy with that. On the same log, no word of a lie, were again lots and lots of this creature. This is an ignuman wasp. Now that tail from the tip of the abdomen there to the tip of the tail is about two inches long. So this is actually quite a whopper of an insect. In total, you know, tip of tail to tip of head, three and a half inches long, something like that. So it's a really impressive insect. And this, this female does exactly the same as the horn tail in the previous photograph, in that she inserts her tail, her, her ovipositor, into the timber and lays her eggs, which hatch and develop into larvae, and then, then they feed on the heartwood of the timber, as the, the horn tail does too. One of the most common of the insect species that we have in Britain are the crane flies. Now there are maybe 30, I suppose, species of crane fly of different sizes and shapes and colors and so on. Um, but this is the common or garden crane fly, the one that fl flies around the house uh, in late summer and uh, early, uh, early autumn. They're the ones that actually lay the eggs into, into your lawn and give you leather jackets, which can damage your lawn. I think they're quite beautiful, I have to say. Um, my dog, I've got a, a beautiful working cocker spaniel and she loves to chase them. She never catches them, of course, because they're very, very canny and just keep out of reach. But she does love their fluttering flight. In Britain, we've got, well, over 40 species of dragon and damsel flies. And that figure is sort of growing daily along with the, the sort of butterfly species uh, because of global warming. And we often have now continental species actually living in uh, Britain and breeding in Britain. Years ago, when I first started uh, on my sort of wildlife quest, Things like uh, red vein darters and those sort of species, <coughs> excuse me, were very rare vagrant visitors to Britain. And now they actually breed in various places in, uh, in our country. This is a four spot chaser. It's one of a, uh, a number of chaser species and it sort of does, its name sort of does what it says on the tin. It has, has four spots on each pair of wings. It's a very common dragonfly in a wide variety of different habitats uh, throughout Britain. It's on the wing, it's actually one of the earliest of the species to be on the wing, so it'll be flying around from kind of May onwards, I suppose, something like that. All of the dragonfly species are fabulous aeronauts. They can fly up, down, forward, back, side to side, and put out helicopter pilots to shame. They're great predators. They really are great predators. And they um, 
eat a wide variety of prey, right up to things like butterflies and other small damsel and dragonflies too. They're creatures of habit. When you find a place where one of them is settled, often it will go on a hunting foray and return more or less back to the same place. They have huge compound eyes and they have huge compound eyes because they need them to be able to locate and track and uh, chase down prey. And this is a broad bodied chaser, this is a female. And this is another species whose name does exactly what it says on the tin. In the sun, this female's body would be pulsating and pulsing. Um, it's a really fabulous uh, creature. And again, it's around on the wing around the same time, uh, time as the previous species. The male uh, has a sort of body where the female has this sort of bronzy color. It's quite a big insect, I suppose, from tip of nose to tip of tail. It's probably about two inches long, maybe something like that, maybe even two and a half inches long. So it is quite a, a substantial insect. Don't you just love those wing veins? I think they're incredible and they, they actually light up the, uh, the whole wing area of this particular insect. As I said earlier, dragonflies are consonant flyers. This is a, an emperor dragonfly. It's about the largest species of dragonfly that we have in Britain. And it's often known as the twitchers dragonfly because it's the one that often gets people um, interested in um, dragonflies. You often see it flying around um, on, the, on the wing sort of, you know, um late may through to almost the sort of first frosts i suppose in the in the autumn and this is where they all start dragonflies um have a life cycle with, that is part aquatic and part uh, sort of sort of terrestrial and um they can be well, underwater for up to five years. This is a, um, a sort of common thing with uh, dragonflies. They spend, you know, a year or, as I say, up to five years in, underwater, eating and eating and eating. Um, this is a, um, a, a fabulous chaser dragonfly larvae. It will eat almost even up to small fish and that sort of thing. So uh, it's quite a it's quite a, a predator, really. We have something like, uh, I suppose, mm, in the region of six hundred different species of spider, which is really quite a remarkable. Um, number of species actually and they range from the very very small up to the uh, the unusual uh, like this crab spider crab spiders again do what they say on the tin there's no doubt about that and they lie in wait for insects to visit their particular bloom and then they pounce and they eat them on the fly so to speak we have some spectacular species. Uh, this one is called a wasp spider for a sort of obvious reasons, I guess. Um, it's a species of the south coast of Britain. Can be found in, in Dorset and Hampshire and places like that from sort of late summer onwards. It's a really beautiful thing. It has a, a, a very unusual web, the web sort of um, becomes sort of latticed, I suppose, is the best way to describe it. Um, 
and its size and coloration make it very easy to identify. One of the interesting things about spiders, it's, a, it's sort of a, this is sort of a girl's night talk, really, because um, as we saw earlier, clays are the females and the, they bite. Most spiders that you see will be females. And the reason for that is that um, the males are extremely small and they keep well out of the way because female spiders have a habit uh, after mating of make, making a, a meal of the male spider. And so the male spiders tend to be unobtrusive and quiet and uh, you know, not really sort of showy so that they, they can make a quick escape once they've mated with the female. Garden spiders, of course, are very common in late summer and uh, in late summer, early autumn, you often find um, hedges and bushes and trees, <coughs> excuse me, covered in a skein of incredible um, webs that the spider spins to catch its prey. Garden spiders are particularly good at catching insects on the wing. And when they catch them, they run them down in the web and they bite them to um, basically sort of sedate them, if you like. And then they wrap them in a silken shroud so that they can put, be put into the spider's larder to be eaten at a later date. Now, that's quite gruesome, really, but in many ways, it's also fascinating. As I said earlier on, Britain is home to around about 55 species of butterflies, growing daily because of global warming. And these days we have things like um, Queen, of, uh, Queen of Spain fertilities and that sort of thing uh, that now breed on the south coast of, of Britain. This is a, a skipper butterfly, skipper butterflies, are a bit like a cross between a butterfly and a moth because they are very hairy indeed. They have a sort of whirring flight as they fly from flower to flower. And the, there are several uh, species of, of skipper, some very common, some extremely rare. The uh, silver spotted skipper is confined to only a few sites in the whole of Britain uh, now. Uh, whereas things like small skippers, large skippers, grizzled skippers, dingy skippers can be found in many, many meadows up and down the length and breadth of Britain. This is, a, I quite like this photograph. This is a Queen of Spain fritillary. Now I like it because she's got her nose in the air looking all sort of snooty and queen-like. Big butterfly and very readily identified because of these beautiful sort of pearly silver uh, markings on the underside of the wing. Fertilities generally use um, violets and plants like that as their larval food plant. Butterflies often have, have quite specific plants that they use as their larval food plant. For example, the orange tip, will, which is more or less just starting to be on the wing now, will use cuckoo flower as its larval food plant. So they are quite uh, they are quite specific, really, in the plants that they will use. This is a this is a species of butterfly which is just starting to make a reappearance in Britain. It used to be. Uh, a reasonably common butterfly in the south of England up until maybe a hundred years ago, something like that. But then it declined and became extinct. Now, because of global warming, they are making their way across the, uh, the, the channel and are starting to breed in very small numbers again in the south of Britain. This is a black vein white. And again, its name does exactly what it says on the tin. I do apologise if you can hear a, a sort of whimpering and whining noise. This is my dog wanting to come into the room because she has to be part of everything. So I do apologise. It's not me whimpering and whining, I can assure you. 
This, I think, is a bit of a bling butterfly. It's a thing called a green hair streak. Now, hair streaks, there's about, I don't know, half a dozen, half a dozen pairs, uh, sorry, half a dozen types of hair streak in Britain, from the very common, like the, uh, the green hair streak, up to um, hair streaks like the brown hair streak or the black hair streak, and then even to a, a lesser extent, the white letter hair streak, which are all, well, they're so rare, they're like chicken's teeth. They're extremely rare. <coughs> Green hair streaks will be on the wing from the end of May. And they're quite difficult to spot, actually, because when they fly, their upper wings, which are more of a, an olive green, don't give away much at all. It isn't until you follow one and see it settle. And they do settle quite readily, I have to say, that you realise just what an incredibly beautiful creature they, it is. Um, they are quite fabulous, fabulous things. I suppose they've got a wingspan of maybe say, 30 millimetres, something like that. So it's not a big butterfly. This is an Adonis blue. Now, the Adonis blue is one of Britain's rarest butterflies. Some years ago, before I, I had actually seen one of these things, I said to a, a colleague of mine, I, I said, well, how do you know if you've seen a, an Adonis blue? And his reply is sort of stuck with me, really. And he said, if you think you've seen an Adonis blue, you haven't. And I, I didn't quite understand what that meant until the, I saw one for the first time at a place called Martin Down, Down in Hampshire. And I sat on the side of a little just sort of shallow quarry. It was quite a dull day and I'd not seen many butterflies at all. And I sat having my butties and a uh, drink from a flask on the side of a quarry. Uh, and the sun came out and I looked at the floor of the quarry and all of a sudden this fabulous blue appeared on the floor of the quarry and I knew immediately that it was an, an, an Adonis blue. It couldn't be anything else. The blue is so different to the other blue butterflies in Britain and we have several species of blue butterflies to go at. We have the Adonis blue, chalk hill blue, common blue, um, the brown argus, northern brown argus, they're all members of the blue clan. But for me, by far the most attractive is the Adonis blue. It's, like I say, quite a rare creature. It has two broods, uh, one generally at the end of May and the other sort of the end of August, September time, something like that. So if you miss the first brood, go back to the, the place that you know they are in August and September, and I bet you'll see it at that point as well. In Britain, we have something like 2,400 species of moth. Now, this particular species isn't one of them. This is a peacock moth, and it's the largest species of Lepidoptera moth or butterfly found in Europe. It has a wingspan of almost four or five inches, so it's a real whopper of a creature. I photographed this particular one in the Cévennes in the south of France a few years ago, and it just is the most spectacular creature. Moths in Britain, um, they, they range from the ones, ones that you see batting themselves against your windows at night, down to micro moths, which are very, very small. Many other species of moth are incredibly common, <clears throat> but others are, well, equally uh, on the rare side of the spectrum as well. There are a variety of different types of, of moth, um, noctuids, geometers, hawk moths. Hawk moths are the spectacular big species of moth. Um, which we have perhaps a half a dozen different types in this country. 
Um, I absolutely adore moth trapping and I do it uh, all summer long. I love it because you never know what you're going to find when you turn the light off in the morning and see what's in the trap. Quite often you get odd things like blue tits and blackbirds that have gone in the, into the trap after the moths. And uh, when you lift the, uh, the lid off the trap, they fly out, sometimes even with a moth in their mouth as they disappear. But it is quite a, it's a wonderful thing to do. Um, and I'm part of the garden moth scheme on uh, Facebook as well. So it's a great thing to do. Moths, as I say, there are 2,400 species in Britain. I've not seen anywhere near all of that, but they are fabulous, fabulous aliens amongst us. One of the nice things I think about insects uh, in, in general is they, they do unexpected things. This is the larvae of, and the newly hatched larvae, I should say, of a green veined white butterfly. And basically it's, well, just a few millimeters long and it's eaten its way out of its egg, which is the thing on the left that looks like a bit of something out of alien or something like that. And it basically now just lives to eat and grow and grow and grow through various instars and sheddings of its skin until it pupates and metamorphoses and hatches out to become the adult imago or butterfly. Caterpillars, as I say, are just there to eat. Well, they eat and poo. That's the other thing. That's the only other, only other thing that um, caterpillars do. This is the head of a pale tussock moth caterpillar. And isn't that just the most alien a thing that you can imagine? It really is truly an alien amongst us. In Britain, there are something like 15,000 different types of fungi and molds. Now, they range from the tiny to the, the, the insignificant, really, and the unusual that you would never think of as a, a fungi or a mold, up to the macro fungi like this one. The, this is a, a thing called porcelain fungus. And it really does what, do what it says on the tin. The cap there uh, is very sort of um, slippery and slimy. Um, and it really does lend itself to the name porcelain fungus. This particular species has gills and you can see the gills on the underside of the cap there. Generally speaking, there are two sort of main types of fungi, gilled fungi like this one and uh, poured fungi like the boletus and that sort of thing. There are also spore shooters like um, puffballs and earth stars and things like that. And talk of the devil, this is ind indeed an, an earth star. It's a thing called the collared or geostrum triplex earth star. And it's the most common species to be found in Britain. Um, I absolutely adore earth stars. Uh, there, there must be, there must be about 20 species, I suppose, something like that in Britain, most of which I've only ever been seen once in a whole century. So they are incredibly, incredibly rare. Now they have a, a cap, the, that, that sort of globe in the middle is their cap. Remember uh, I mentioned caps, caps a couple of slides ago with the porcelain fungus? Well, this is their cap. And basically you often find um, puffballs growing underneath things like bramble and that sort of thing because what they do is they secrete themselves there and, and sport, uh, sorry, and uh, fruit there, so that when it rains, water drips off the leaves onto the cap and a little shoot of spores come out, comes out of the central hole in the cap there. And that's how they spread themselves around. Now, if you remember earlier on, I was saying that butterflies have quite specific 
um, larval food plants. Well, fungi are almost specific to individual types of tree. They'll pick a tree and they will only fruit on that um, as a, um, a parasite, if you like, on that particular species of plant or, uh, or um, sometimes animal. This is the fly agaric. Fly agarics are the fungi of fairy stories. Um, <laughs> there's quite an interesting anecdote uh, about fly agarics in that basically you, you shouldn't eat them because they're quite, uh, they're sort of full of um, harmful materials, hallucinogens and all sorts of things. But the Laplanders discovered that reindeer love to eat fly agaric. And so basically what they do is they dry it and they shake it out onto the tundra and it attracts in all of their reindeer. Now, I don't know how they found this next bit out, but somebody must have tried it. When a reindeer eats a fly agaric, it doesn't become intoxicated, it manage, manages, manages to use a sort of to sidestep, if you like, the hallucinogens in the, uh, in its, in, in the fly agaric. But some happy Laplander decided to uh, collect reindeer urine and drink it. And it was discovered that they could get high on the hallucinogens in the reindeer urine. Now, if you ever have to go to um, Lapland to take your grandkids to see Father Christmas and somebody offers you a glass of lemonade, I suggest that you decline. <laughs> That's absolutely true. They, they, uh, they drink the, um, the urine of, of reindeer that have eaten uh, fly garricks. Fungi, like a lot of uh, aliens, have fabulously descriptive names. This is a thing called a shaggy foliota. Now, isn't that just a wonderful name? I, it's an incredible thing. So quite a common fungi, likes to uh, parasitize uh, uh, um, things like beaches and that sort of thing. So um, they're quite common and certainly in the autumn, you can find them quite regularly in beech plantations. Yet another alien amongst us is this. It's a sporing or a fruiting body of a liverwort. And in Britain, we've got over 300 different species of liverworts. Around our coast, we have still more aliens amongst us. This is a common periwinkle. Look at that beautiful, cute little face. I do, do so love periwinkles. And this is another species of periwinkle, again, making its way underneath the channel rack and the, uh, the bladder rack uh, around the edge of a rock pool. Utterly alien is the hermit crab. This one is sort of living in the shell of a periwinkle. It's a very small hermit crab. As they grow, they sort of uh, vacate a shell that's too small for them and go off in search of a bigger abode. Wouldn't it be lovely if, if we could do that? When, when our houses get too small for us, we'll just go off and find another one. There are lots of aliens amongst us beneath the bark. Lots of wood lice. We have something like 20 different species of wood lice. Uh, they're fabulous creatures, lovely to photograph. And I have to say, I really do like sort of hunting around under the bark and finding these creatures. This is a springtail, tiny, tiny little things. This one is less than five millimeters long. So it's a tiny little creature. And when you lift up a, a piece of bark or a, some leaf litter, these are the things that throw themselves into the air uh, and disappear at a, a great rate of knots. 
this is a, a, a true alien. I love it. It's a thing called a pseudo scorpion. It's pseudo because it doesn't have the sting, but it does have the pincers of the scorpion. This is a tiny thing, less than five millimeters along from tip of nose to tip of tail. And it lives regularly under the bark of fallen trees. Well, we've sort of reached the end of our Aliens Amongst Us um, story for tonight. I do hope that you've enjoyed what I've had to say. And, <clears throat> excuse me, I do hope that I've not stumbled uh, very much at all. Um, and I have thoroughly enjoyed presenting to you. Um, I have a long association with the Surrey Wildlife Trust uh, as I worked uh, on a farm in Surrey for 12 months in the mid eighties. So I love the heathlands of, of Surrey and places like that. So many, many thanks.